So now let's have a look at the ear. And the ear will house two sensory systems. We're going to have the sensory system for balance and equilibrium, as well as the sensory organ for the detection of sound. So if we look at the ear, we can divide it into three main parts. We have the external ear, we have the middle ear, and we have the internal ear. The external and middle ear are both air-filled spaces, and the external ear basically starts from the part we can see of the ear called the auricle, sometimes also called the penna of the ear, and that is this flap that's got a lot of elastic cartilage inside, and it's this flap of skin that acts kind of as a funnel to funnel sound waves into what we call the external acoustic meatus, which as you probably recall from our study of bones, that that projects through the temporal bone. And that will lead to this thing here called the tympanic membrane. And this membrane is the border between the external ear and the middle ear. This is sometimes also called the tympanic cavity for the, that reason, because the tympanic membrane is the border between the external and middle ear. In the middle ear, we will find three tiny little bones called ossicles. We have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And the malleus just means hammer, incus means anvil, and stapes means stirrup. And they get their names, these Latin names, from the fact that they look like these objects. The malleus will be attached directly to the tympanic membrane, will vibrate this one called the incus, which will then push against this stapes or stirrup, which will push against this little window here called the oval window in the inner ear. And the inner ear we will see is fluid filled. And it has two major areas. It's got the cochlea, which is means snail shell. And this is what's going to house our organ for hearing. And then we have these semicircular canals in the vestibule, which will house our sense of balance and equilibrium. So once we get into the inner ear, we're going to have fluid-filled spaces. We're going to have two separate chambers, one that's going to be filled with a type of fluid called endolymph. And then the endolymph will be that area that's filled with endolymph will be surrounded by perilymph. So we actually have two separate chambers within here, a chamber within a chamber. So we're going to have what's called a membranous chamber that fits inside this bony chamber, also called the bony labyrinth. And we will see that when we look at it in a little closer detail, it's going to be the membranous chamber that's going to be filled with the endolymph and the bony chamber or bony labyrinth that will be filled with perilymph. Let's back up for a second into the middle ear. We will see we have a passageway into the middle ear that leads to the nasopharynx, and that is the part of the throat behind the nose. This is going to help the ear equalize pressure. Because as you can imagine, if you go up in altitude, or let's say you go down into the bottom of a swimming pool, the pressure on the outside of the ear is going to change. And that is going to put pressure on this tympanic membrane. And you can think of the tympanic membrane very much like the head of a drum. And it's going to transmit sound into the middle ear in very much the same way. So this tympanic membrane gets its name from, well, tympany, tympanic, so drum-like. It's going to transmit sound as it's vibrated through this auditory external acoustic meatus, sometimes called the auditory canal. Now, the reason I point this out, this external acoustic meatus, also called the external auditory canal, is different from the auditory tube, which is also called the eustachian tube. So getting back to this idea of equalizing pressure, we need to keep the pressure on this side the same as the pressure on this side. So if you go up to really high altitude and there's not as much air pressure here, then you'll have more pressure in here. And you don't want that because that would cause the tympanic membrane to bulge out a little bit. And likewise, if you go underwater deep, you know what's going to happen is you're going to have the water pressure push this membrane in. And it's a delicate membrane, like the head of a drum. If you beat a drum too hard, you could break that membrane. So that's what we want to avoid doing. So if you've ever done any kind of diving, you probably know that you will blow air into the nasopharynx that will force air up into this auditory tube, and that will equalize the pressure on this side 
to equal that on this side. And people who don't do this can, can risk rupturing the eardrum. All right, now the auricle, as we've said, is going to surround the external acoustic meatus, and it's going to act as a funnel to direct sound into the external acoustic meatus, where it is then directed towards the tympanic membrane. Now, in some animals, they can actually change where the auricle is pointing. We cannot. And we have the external acoustic meatus, which leads to the tympanic membrane, as we've seen. All in the internal, or sorry, the external ear, we're going to have ceruminous glands, and these are going to secrete earwax. So earwax hopefully is going to keep stuff out of the external acoustic meatus and keep it from coming in contact with the tympanic membrane. And it also is going to slow growth of microorganism stuff like this. However, it can become a problem. If it builds up too much, you can get an earwax plug. And that's going to act just like an earplug. And that's actually going to attenuate sound. So sometimes people come in who complain of hearing loss with no reason or no understanding of why. And somebody looks in there with a, with a, with an otoscope and they say, hey, you've got a big old bunch of earwax in here. So nowadays they usually get it out with carbamide peroxide, let it soften up, and then they use a warm water syringe to flush it out. So sometimes in the clinic, people will come in and have earwax removed from the external acoustic meatus. All right, the middle ear is also called the tympanic cavity, as we've saw, seen, and it has that passageway to the nasopharynx that via the auditory tube, and this is going to allow the pressurization to equal on both sides. We saw our auditory ossicles already, our malleus, our hammer, our incus and stapes, so our hammer, anvil, and stirrup. When we look at them, we see that the hammer, or the malleus, is going to be directly connected to the tympanic membrane. So you can imagine that as you beat this thing, it's going to vibrate this ossicle right here, this malleus. The malleus, in turn, is going to push on the incus, which means anvil, as we've said, which in turn is going to push the stirrup or the stapes up against this oval window. And then when we look at what goes on in the internal ear, we'll see how these first water sound pressure waves are converted into mechanical pressure that will then be converted into fluid pressure waves once it gets into the internal ear. And then we'll see how trans signal transduction occurs from there. Now notice we have some safeguards. Imagine you were suddenly bombarded with a really loud sound. Well, we've got the tensor tympani muscle right here, and it's going to pull the, the malleus, and we also have the stapedius muscle, which pulls the stapes and really holds these things so they can't vibrate. And the reason for that is so they don't vibrate so much that they push so hard on this oval window that they do damage to the very sensitive receptors that are in the middle ear, or sorry, in the inner ear. All right, so here's what they look like in real life. Here is our tympanic membrane. So we're looking from the inside. Here's our malleus. Here's our incus. And you can see the stapes actually is a stirrup shape. All right, here they are. Malleus, incus, and stapes. We actually had some of these in the lab. And human ones are about this big, so they're tiny. They are the smallest bones in the body. In fact, you can, in some people, what they'll do is they'll start to ossify the connections between them. And people will have some type of hearing loss when these things ossify, and they're no longer able to, to vibrate the way they should. All right, so the, temp, the vibrations of these ossicles, as we've seen, are going to vibrate the the tympanic membrane. If we, or I should say the other way around, the tympanic membrane is going to vibrate these ossicles. And if we have a sound pressure wave that is so large that it causes huge deflections within that tympanic membrane, then it's going to cause huge translations of movement in those those ossicles. And once again, we have two muscles that as soon as that starts to happen will immediately tense up and basically lock those bones so that they can't vibrate as much. And that prevents downstream damage in the inner ear where that pressure from the pushing of the stapes in and out of that oval window would cause a great deal of damage to the, to the very, sensor, very sensitive sensory receptors that we'll look at a little bit later on.
All right, when we get into the in inner ear, we will see that it contains both a membranous labyrinth and a bony labyrinth. And the membranous labyrinth, the reason it's called a, a labyrinth, as you've seen, it's kind of wound up on itself. The cochlea is wound up on itself, and it looks kind of like a labyrinth or a maze. So you have the bony labyrinth, which is in the tympanic, or sorry, within the, the temporal bone itself. And then we have the membranous labyrinth, which basically follows the bony labyrinth, except that it's a membrane that that is surrounded by endo, sorry, perilymph. So endolymph is in the membranous labyrinth and perilymph is in the bony labyrinth. And we will find that we can subdivide this, these two areas into the vestibule and the semicircular canals. These two things right here, the vestibule and the vestibule and the semicircular canals will be our two parts of the ear associated with balance and equilibrium. The cochlea is going to be the part associated with hearing. And this is why our cranial nerve 8 is called the vestibular cochlear nerve or vestibulocochlear nerve, because it's bringing information from the vestibule and the cochlea. If we look at this picture, here is this blown up, and you can look inside. So the blue represents the membranous labyrinth. And inside of that, we have endolymph. The Beige part on the outside represents the bony labyrinth, and this is an actual indention in the temporal bone itself. And the membranous labyrinth fits within the bony labyrinth. It has the same shape, and between them there's a space, and that space is going to be filled with perilymph. And we will see that we've got here, we've got this area, our vestibule, which is interconnected with the semicircular canals, this is going to be, all of this over here is going to be responsible for balance and equilibrium. All of this, the cochlea, is going to be responsible for hearing. All right, so if we took a cross section of it, if we go back over here and took a cross section right through here, or actually through here, and we looked outside here, we would see the bony labyrinth with perilymph surrounding the membranous labyrinth with endolymph. So when we look at the vestibule, we will see the, the vestibule is further subdivided into the saccule and the utricle. Both of these are going to give us sensations of gravity and linear acceleration. So if you put your head like this, or like this, or like this, or you accelerate suddenly in a car, or you brake suddenly in a car, these are going to be the parts of the ear that will be stimulated. The semicircular canals will register movements like this. So rotational movements. So if you're actively moving and you do a cartwheel or a flip or you just spin around, these are going to be the parts of the ear that will be registering that. So these are going to be responsive to rotations of the head. And when you look at it, you'll know this, that there are three of them and they're all orthogonal to one another. So they basically represent the three planes of movement, the X, Y, and Z planes. All right, when we look at the next part, the cochlea, this is going to take contain the cochlear duct. And the cochlear duct, interestingly, you see how it's kind of wound up. It's very much like having a rug that you rolled up. And when we look at it, we're going to look at it both in its sort of wound up form, and then we talk about its function, we're going to stretch it out into one long apparatus. So it's going to be like a long tube with an inner tube that is the membranous labyrinth. And this is what's going to contain our sensation of hearing or our apparatus for detecting auditory stimuli. We've got two sort of entrance ways, if you will. I don't really want to call them entrance ways, but two passageways to the internal ear. One is called the round window, and it's near the bottom of the vestibule. And then we have the oval window, and that's the one that's connected to the base of the stapes, and that has a bunch of collagen fibers that interface the, the stapes with the inside of the, the middle, the inner ear, I'm sorry, the inner ear. So in the inner ear, we're going to have three major parts of the inner ear, two of which are considered together as the vestibular apparatus. So we're going to have the vestibule itself, 
which contains the utricle and the saccule. And this is going to be sensitive to gravity, so position of the head with respect to gravity, and linear acceleration. Adjoining the vestibule is going to be the semicircular canals. So the semicircular canals are going to register movement, dynamic rotation. And these two things together are going to transduce signals about balance and equilibrium. Now sound will be monitored from the cochlea. So the cochlea is going to transduce impulses that started as sound pressure waves reaching the tympanic membrane and then are translated through the mechanical vibration of the ossicles and then will be converted into fluid pressure waves that are going to stimulate the receptors within the cochlea and the cochlea then those receptors will then transduce that sound into electrical impulses. So in all three divisions or all three parts of the ear we will see that the main receptor that we're going to be looking at is called the hair cell and this is because it has these microvilli long microvilli like projections at the apical surface and these are very specialized projections and we'll see that although the morphology of the hair cells is different within each of the different parts of the ear the basic idea is the same so we're going to have these cells with these microvilli long specialized microvilli on the apical surface and when these things are moved by an external force such as fluid then they will cause a depolarization of their neuron, their sensory neuron that's uh, monitoring their activity. So let's look first at the semicircular ducts. These are going to be continuous with the utricle, which as we've said before is part of our, ve our vestibule. So we've got at each semicircular duct we have a swelling or an opening called the ampulla. It's probably just easier to look at it. So here is our ampulla here. And within that area, we're going to have a gelatinous mass within the ampulla called the, the cupula. And we have the hair cells with their cilia embedded into this gelatinous mass. So when we look at it, here is our cupula. These are our hair cells, and they have these little microvilli-like projections sticking up out of them, and they are embedded in the basal membrane called the crista ampullaris. So here's our crista ampullaris with hair cells, then we've got our supporting cells, and then we have the individual dendrites of the hair cells monitoring what the hair cells are doing. So basically we can see that we have this gelatinous mass into which the cilia are, or I should say the what we call stereocilia are embedded into it. So these things that are sticking up are called stereocilia, even though they're really more like microvilli. And there's going to be one cilium that is a cilium called a kinocilium. And in this particular apparatus, what happens is as this gelatinous mass is bent by movement of fluid through the canal, it's going to bend the cilia with them, these stereocilia. And as they lean towards the kinocilium, it's going to encode one direction. And as they lean away from the kinocilium, it's going to encode the opposite direction. So you can imagine that if you're rotating your head, as you start the movement, you will start to move, but fluid inside your ear stays stationary. But with respect to what's going on inside your ear, so when you move, because of the inertia of the fluid in the semicircular canals, your semicircular canals are going to move around the stationary fluid, so the fluid then is going to press the cupula over. So it's going to put pressure on it, and that pressure of the cupula is then going to bend the stereocilia. So the stereocilia will either bend away from or towards the kinocilium, and that will either cause depolarization or hyperpolarization of the hair cell, and then that will cause either an increase or decrease of neurotransmitter release to the monitoring sensory neuron. So here's a representation of a hair cell. Here we can see the kinocilium, which is actually a cilium. You can see the microtubuli structure here. It's kind of cut through. It's quite a bit longer than the stereocilia which are actually specialized microvilli. But as the stereocilia are bent towards the kinocilium, then they will depolarize the cell and cause an increase in neurotransmitter release. 
By the same token, if they're bent away from the cancillium, then they will hyperpolarize the cell and cause a decrease in neurotransmitter release. So either way, that's going to give us an indication of which direction they're being moved and which way the gelatinous mass or the cupula is being pushed. So if we look at the orientation of these cupula, we see that they're at right angles to one another. So this way we can register rotation in all three planes. And complex movements then can be encoded by the differential signal transduction in each of the three semicircular canals. Now let's look at the apparatus for static equilibrium. So that would be the utricle and saccule, and these are located in the vestibule. And both of them have a spot called a macula on which the hair cells are embedded. And so on top of the macula, we also have a gelatinous mass. And this gelatinous mass will be aided i.e. we will have things to make it heavier called statoconia. And these are basically calcium carbonate crystals that are sitting on top of the gelatinous mass. And these calcium carbonate crystals are sometimes called otoliths for ear stone because they're very similar to, well, little tiny rocks, ear rocks. So if we look at them, we will see that there are two of them, one that's or oriented horizontally and one that's oriented vertically. So here in the saccule, we have one here, this one that's oriented vertically, and we can see how the cilia, well, in this case, they're really microvilli, are embedded in the gelatinous mass. Notice these do not have a kinocilium, but they do have these uh, graded in height microvilli, just like we saw with the hair cells in the ampulla. So here what we see instead is the gelatinous mass with these odorless or calcium carbonate crystals, and that gives them weight. So that as we shift our head position around, that's going to cause the gelatinous mass to move with gravity and once again bend the hair cells or bend the projections on the hair cells. So here's an example of a guy leaning his head back, and here is our horizontal gelatinous mass sitting on the horizontal macula, and as he tilts his head back, then the gelatinous mass along with the otoliths are pulled by gravity and that's going to bend the cells, the projections on the top of the cells. And then of course that's going to cause an increase in the neurotransmitter release via the receptors into the sensory neuron. Now there are pathways for hearing and equilibrium. The first one we're going to look at are the vestibular pathways and they're going to start as all of these nerve fibers come together at a vestibular ganglion. And then that, what arises from the vestibular ganglion will be the vestibular branch of our cranial nerve eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. And this is going to synapse within the vestibular nuclei. And as you recall, those are right on the border between the pons and the medulla oblongata where the vestibular cochlear nerve comes in. So we're going to have several important functions of the vestibular nuclei. First of all, they're going to provide a very important input to the cerebellum because the cerebellum is going to take sensations from balance and equilibrium, proprioception, and vision, and that's how it's going to help us maintain our balance and maintain our postural tone so that we don't fall over. So this is going to be one of the four functions of the vestibular nuclei. We are also, well, we also, before we even relay that information to the cerebellum, we have to integrate the information coming from both sides of the head. So first we're going to integrate the information from both sides of the head. We're going to relay some of that to the cerebellum, some of it to the cerebral cortex so that we become consciously aware of what we're doing, as well as sending some of those commands to the brainstem nuclei in the spinal cord. So let's have a look. Here are the pathways. Here are the bundles of nerves coming off each of the ampulla of the semicircular canals. And then we've got our vestibule. We've got our our utricle and our saccule, and they're going to have their bundles of nerves all joining together at this vestibular ganglion. The axon fibers that arise from that are going to form the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Here's the cochlear branch. It will be coming from the cochlea, which is around in this area, and they will come together as the cranial nerve 8, which then is going to, going to synapse in the vestibular complex. And we've got projections to the superior colliculus, the cerebral cortex, to the cerebellum, to the red nucleus, to other brainstem areas, and the vestibular spinal tract. So we've got quite a bit of, of information that's being relayed all over the brain. And that's going to help us obviously keep from falling over.
Now, one of the things that we're going to see is a lot of our reflexive head and neck movements are going to be from the vestibular nuclei so that we can keep our balance. Peripheral muscle tone uh, will also be, a lot of it will be regulated because of information that we're receiving from our vestibular nuclei. All right, another thing we're going to see is eye movements. So one of the things that's interesting is we're going to be getting some information via to the superior colliculus. And so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to have eye movements coordinated with us trying to keep our balance or trying to make sense of a picture in space because we're always moving and you're going to make movements towards points of interest in that space. And some of these eye movements are very rapid. They can be called saccades. So when you're reading, you're making little saccades, little eye movements, or eye movements to things that while you're surveying a scene and your eyes are moving from one point or another to the scene. Now, in lab, this is something that we discussed, is what happens if you are really spinning and you're trying to keep your eyes focused on a point. Well, if you've ever seen a ballet dancer or a skater, what they will do is they will turn their head, pick a point, pick the same point every time, and keep rotating. And they can rotate extremely fast without losing their balance because they're able to pick a point and focus on it. However, if you just spin someone randomly around, as we will see in the Baronet test, and they keep their eyes open but they're not focusing on a point, and then you stop them suddenly, then their eyes will start bouncing back and forth like this. And that is called nystagmus. And that is because the eye is attempting to focus on a specific point in order to keep the visual information aligned with the, the sense of balance and equilibrium. So if this sort of saccade and capture a point of space movement gets disturbed somehow, so saccades are normal eye movements, you see them in everyday function, but when you get nystagmus, this is when your eyes cannot find a point to focus on and they'll bounce back and forth like that. So if you spin rapidly and your eyes don't have anything to fix on, when you stop the person, you'll notice that their eyes are usually moving back and forth rapidly in the head. Now, other things can cause nystagmus as well. There can be pathological manifestations of nystagmus, but nystagmus is a completely normal thing that we see when someone has been spun around and they've kind of lost their sense of balance. All right, now let's talk about hearing. And now we're going to switch over to the next part of the ear called the cochlea. And the cochlea is also going to have hair cells in it. And it's also going to have our fluid-filled compartments. We're going to have our membranous labyrinth that is filled with endolymph, surrounded by our bony labyrinth filled with perilymph. However, the interesting thing is, is that the membranous labyrinth does not go all the way to the end of the bony labyrinth. So there's a little space. And we will see that we have... When we look at it, we have sort of three levels. And when we look at the cochlea, it's, as we say, it's kind of like a snail shell, but it's also sort of like a wound up carpet. And that basically it's a very long tube that has been coiled around. And you can think of it as a tube within a tube. So what we'll have is we'll have the cochlear duct, which is this little bit right here. And the cochlear duct is the part that has the endolymph in it. and on either side of the cochlear duct, we'll have these two chambers of the perilymph, of the bony labyrinth. And we'll see that the cochlear duct spans the whole bony labyrinth. So we have a chamber on top and a chamber on the bottom. So if we were to look at it in cross section, this is one continuous tube with this kind of wedge shaped tube within the larger tube, and it's wound around itself, kind of like a rolled up carpet. And we'll see we've got sensory neurons coming and coming into these ganglia that we'll see. And these little spiral ganglia, as they're called, because this is a spiral organ, sometimes called the spiral organ of corti. And their axons will then join the cochlear nerve, which will then join the vestibular cochlear nerve. So anyway, if we look at this whole structure, you've got to remember that this is just one giant tube that has another tube within it embedded within it. And so the top part of the tube is called the scala vestibuli. And the bottom part of the tube is called the scala tympani. And both of these contain perilymph. The scala vestibuli will be continuous with the oval window. 
or the oval window will be pressing on the fluid within the scala vestibule, and the scala vestibule will wrap around. So here it is, here it is, here it is, and here it is, here it is. And then the scala tympani will be this part, and it's just wrapping around as well and being coiled up on itself. So this is one long continuous structure. And we will see that the round window is going to be the interface at the end of the scala tympani or scala tympani. Yeah. So if we were to talk about how we're going to transduce the sound now, let's start with our eardrum. So the eardrum is like a head of a drum, and it's going to vibrate when we have sound pressure waves. That is waves just like we saw in light, but this time it's going to be molecules of air. And as you make a sound, then you're going to compress the molecules of air as the sound is, is being made. So think of shaking something, think of shaking a tuning fork, and we've seen one of those in lab now, or we'll see one, but think of striking a string. So if you strike a string and you look at what is going on with the string, you'll see that it vibrates. And as the string vibrates this way, that's going to compress the air. And as it vibrates the opposite direction, that's going to cause the, the molecules in the air to expand. So you're literally getting peaks and troughs corresponding with what we call compressions and rarefications of the air that are very similar to the peaks in an ocean wave and then the troughs that follow them. So you're going to have these sound waves traveling through the air. And just like we had with light, the sound waves will be traveling at different frequencies and different wavelengths. So as we know, the wavelength is going to be inversely proportional to the frequency. So the higher the frequency, if you look at a string and you pick a string or pluck a string, you'll see that the higher the string, the faster it'll vibrate, the more the energy the sound has and the higher the pitch will be. So really short strings tend to vibrate very, very quickly and produce very high sounds. Very long strings, tend to vibrate very slowly to the point you can even see them, and they tend to produce low sounds. So the frequency is going to determine the pitch or the sound. So if we look at a standard piano over there and we play middle C, which is the middle of the keyboard, that will resonate at 512, what we call cycles per second or times a second. We can also call this Hertz, abbreviate HZ. But basically the frequency of the sound is also going to determine what part of the cochlear duct is stimulated. And we'll see that in just a little bit when we get more into the structure of this thing. The intensity of the sound, that is the amplitude. So what is the amplitude? That's the height of the wave. So if we have a really large wave, we have a lot of amplitude in that wave. If we have a really small wave, then we're not going to have as much of the sound. So the high, large amplitude sounds are going to be, or large amplitude waves are going to produce loud noises. And small amplitude waves will produce small sounds, even though they could be at exactly the same frequency. So basically we could have a wave doing this at exactly the same frequency as a wave doing this. And this one is going to be the louder. The louder of the two is going to be the louder because it's going to have more energy behind it, more force, I should say. All right, so when we look at the cochlear duct, let's take a look at the picture. It's easier this way. So here is our cochlear duct, and we see that we're going to have our hair cells embedded right here. And on top of the hair cells, we're going to have this thing called the tectorial membrane. And remember, there's endolymph in here. So imagine that we have our round window that's going to be interfaced with the fluid that's in here. And so if we look at the very beginning of this organ, here would be our round window. And as we press on this round window with the stapes, it's going to push the fluid back and forth in waves at the same frequency as the sound wave that is hitting the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane, or the eardrum, will vibrate at a certain frequency. So if I go over there... I will strike a tone that will vibrate 512 times per second. And that will then hit the tympanic membrane and cause it to vibrate 512 times per second. Then we have this nice amplification process because the 
movement of the tympanic membrane will now vibrate the ossicles. The ossicles, the auditory ossicles, will end with the stapes pushing on the round window, which is then going to cause the fluid in the endolymph to vibrate at the same frequency. Now, what's interesting is, is we have this basilar membrane here. And the basilar membrane is very, very similar to a string in that it will have a certain resonant frequency. That is the frequency at which it vibrates. So when I play that string over there, it's going to be 512 cycles per second. And if I go over there and play, let's just say we play A instead, then we're going to get 440 cycles per second. So if we come over here to the piano, that's going to be 440 cycles per second. And if we were to watch the strings inside the piano vibrate, we would see that this one would vibrate at 440 cycles per second, or times a second. This one at 512. Now, interestingly, the basilar membrane is going to have a different resonant frequency depending on where it is within the cochlea. So some of the membrane, the basilar membrane that's close to the oval window will be resonant at very high frequencies, where those farthest away will be resonant at low frequencies. But what that means is that only that part of the basilar membrane will vibrate that's resonant to that frequency. So as the sound pressure waves, which have now been converted into fluid pressure waves, are moving through the endolymph within the scala vestibuli, they will eventually find the part of the basilar membrane that's resonant, and then they will go through. And then they will go through to the fluid in the, in the scala tympani. And when it goes through, it's going to vibrate the membrane. So what do you think that's going to do? The membrane on which these cells are sitting are now going to be vibrating. And imagine that I am a hair cell. And I got my microvilli up here, and I'm standing on a basilar membrane, and the basilar membrane is the floor, and now the floor starts vibrating underneath me. And I've got my cilia, or my, I'm sorry, my hairs stuck up into that tectorial membrane. Now, as soon as the floor starts vibrating underneath me, then those, those cells, their projections will start to wiggle back and forth, and that will cause those cells to transduce a signal at that frequency. Now here's a picture of them. Here's the tectorial membrane. Here are the hair cells. Here are the micro, the microvilli, the very specialized microvilli that we call hairs. And these are going to be stuck up in the tectorial membrane so that when the floor vibrates, then that's going to shake the cells and that in turn is going to call this, cause the displacement of these, these hairs, which in turn will cause neurotransmitter release and the signal to be transduced along the nerves that monitor the receptors. All right, so let's look at what we were just talking about. So here's a picture. Here's a picture of a tuning fork, and we'll see that in the lab. And tuning fork works very much like a string. When we vibrate this thing, it's going to have a specific frequency. And tuning forks are so called because they were used to be used for tuning the piano so that, or whatever musical instrument you used, so that when you wanted to set the pitch of a particular note, you would listen to the tuning fork and then set the pitch of the string at the same, because strings will become out of tune after a while. In any case, so you can see that as the arm of the tuning fork vibrates in this direction, it compresses the molecules in the air, and as it swings back or vibrates in the other direction, it rarefies the air. So that literally causes these sound pressure waves that make sinusoids. So here's the peak of the wave, the compression of the air, here's the rarefication of the air, or where the air molecules are further apart. And so one wavelength is the distance between them. So the frequency is how many times per second these things happen. So the frequency of, for example, a 512, note for middle C in that case is going to vibrate 512 times per second. And its wavelength is going to be a little bit shorter than say the other note that I played 440A, which the string for that is going to vibrate 440 times a second. And you can imagine that if it only makes 440 cycles, 
then the wavelength is going to be a little bit longer. And if it's making a little bit more cycles or faster, it's going to be a little bit higher and the wavelengths are going to be shorter. So once again, if we go to the keyboard over here, if we go to the keyboard over here, we can see that this note is going to vibrate at a lower frequency than this note. So this note has a higher frequency, it has a shorter wavelength, and it will vibrate faster. All right, now let's just say that we took the cochlea and we unrolled it. Remember that carpet analogy that I used a little bit earlier, that the cochlea is like a rolled up carpet? Now let's just say we unrolled the carpet. Just like unrolling a tuba, if you've ever seen the tuba that sort of winds around. It's like pulling that thing out straight. So here would be our cochlear duct. Here would be our scala vestibuli. And here's our oval window. And here is our scala tympani. Now notice that there's this little turn here where the scala vestibuli becomes the scala tympani. This is called the helicotrema. I'm not sure the book even mentions that, but that is called the helicotrema. And basically, each part of this basilar membrane has a certain resonant frequency, just like we have on the piano over here, with the high frequencies being closest to the oval window, and the low frequencies being down here. So literally what we have is a tonotopic organization, very similar to the keyboard here, where the high keys are on one end and the low keys are on the other. And so we have a tonotopic organization of this, this cochlear duct here. And so remember, it's the basilar membrane that's going to vibrate at the frequency of interest. So let's just say we have a tone, a bunch of sound pressure waves coming in at 6,000 hertz. And this is the area of the basilar membrane that vibrates at 600 hertz. So that sound pressure wave will come in. It will find its resonant frequency here and then it goes into the perilymph and the scala tympani on the other side. But it will vibrate through here to do this. And as it does it, it distorts the membrane at the same frequency like this. And that is what's going to call the cause the basilar membrane to vibrate, and that is what is going to cause the hair cells to move. And then being that their projections are embedded in that tectorial membrane, then when they shake, they're going to start to release neurotransmitter. And what that says is, hey, we just heard a sound at 6,000 hertz. Now, if we had 16,000 hertz, then the basilar membrane would distort here and not here. If the sound were 1,000 hertz, it would distort over here. And basically, the sound pressure wave would come in. And in this case, it's a fluid pressure wave now. It would come in. And it would start to distort the membrane right here if we had a thousand hertz stimulus. And then that wave will continue on to the round window. Now this is important because this is fluid in a closed system. And fluid is not expansible. It doesn't expand and contract like air does. So while we have these pressure waves, when we push in at the oval window, we've got to have some way to relieve the pressure. That's what the round window is for. So when we push in at the oval window, the round window will bulge out. And when the oval window pulls back, then the round window will bulge in. And so you have this because, as we say, the fluid is non-compressible. So it will carry these waves, but where you have pressure on one end, you have to relieve the pressure on the other end. And so that's why we have the round window. All right, so this shows the opposite. This shows the, the oval window moving out as the state piece pulls back and the round window being pulled towards the inside of the scala tympani. All right, so here is the stepwise process of how sound is transduced. First, we have the sound waves. So they're coming in and they are going to interact with the tympanic membrane. They're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane, in turn, is going to cause movement of these auditory ossicles. The auditory ossicles are going to end at the stapes, and that interface is right there on the oval window. And that is going to cause the oval window to move in and out of the scala vestibuli at the same frequency as the sound pressure waves coming in. That's going to induce a fluid pressure wave 
that is at the same frequency. Now, that fluid pressure wave will travel through the cochlear duct until it finds that resonant part of the basilar membrane, and then it will move through the basilar membrane, thus moving the basilar membrane and shaking all the hair cells. And that's going to cause that the hair cells to vibrate against the tectorial membrane, and then that's going to cause the depolarization of those neurons that are monitoring those hair cells. And that's how you get signal transduction from the cochlear duct. Now, once we have received that signal, that signal has to be carried to the brain. And so we're going to have our spiral ganglion that are going to come from each part of the curve of the cochlear duct. And then we're going to have those fibers all come together into the cochlear part of the vestibular cochlear nerve, which will then come and synapse at the medulla oblongata at these cochlear nuclei. And a lot of that information, most of that's going to cross to the opposite side of the brain and then in, ascend to the inferior colliculus of the midbrain. We're also going to have uh, pathways through the thalamus, obviously, at the medial geniculate nucleus, if you recall. So we're going to have the medial geniculate nucleus be our relay. And from there, the information will be relayed up to our primary auditory cortex, which is right along in here in that superior temporal gyrus of the temporal lobe. It's back around here somewhere. So uh, we will have it projected there. We have a primary auditory cortex, which is actually also tonotopically organized, just like the basilar membrane. So it's very interesting that in this case, instead of having a homunculus that's a map of the somatic body, we have a tonotopic organization that is a map of pitches, just like the scales, ascending to descending. So basically, something like that. All right, so when we look at it, here we have our vestibular cochlear nerve. Here are our high frequency sounds in the cochlea, and these are the ones closest to the oval window. And as we get closer and closer to the end of that cochlear duct, we're going to have our low frequency sounds. So we'll see that these, oopsie, these signals will be relayed via the vestibular cochlear nerve, and they will find their way to the cochlear nuclei. Remember, we've got, remember, our superior olivary nuclei that I talked about last time. So some of that information is going to go there. Some of it's going to go into the inferior colliculi. Then we're going to have some of that information go up to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And so here's where a lot of our sensation that we're going to be consciously aware of is going to go. It's going to cross over, and it's going to ascend to the medial geniculate nucleus and then be projected to that primary auditory cortex. And notice that it is also tonotopically organized. So our high frequency pitches are here, and then they will progress to our low frequency pitches. So that we go from high to low, from the inside to the out. So this is what we call tonotopic organization. All right, so basically, hearing is a very, very sensitive thing. And we can hear extremely, extremely low sounds. I don't think the microphone on this computer is good enough to pick it up, but most people with intact hearing can hear something as simple as rubbing your fingers together. And the largest sounds that we can hear would be a trillion-fold increase in the power or the amplitude of the wave. And this or could be really devastating if you have too loud of a sound. So there are certain sounds like jet waves, jet fuel, or jet blasts, I, sh I should say, that would basically just rupture your eardrums and destroy your hearing. So you would never ever want to try and use it to its full potential. And because it does get a lot of wear and tear, and we are exposed to loud sounds all the time that are actually damaging to your hearing, for example, loud rock concerts, car horns, probably one of the worst that you can't really do anything about are fire truck sirens. If you happen to be behind or in front of a fire truck and you're riding a bicycle, too bad. You're going to lose some hearing because there's no way you have to protect yourself against 120 to 130 decibel sounds, which can cause immediate permanent hearing damage. Now, if you are getting sounds that are in the decibel range of 90 decibels, that's going to cause permanent hearing damage after about a few hours of exposure. 
and we have this rating. You've heard me use the term decibel. Decibel is the rating that we use to assign power to, or I should say amplitude, or the loudness of the sound. So this is a logarithmic scale. So when we measure things in decibels, really, really soft sounds are going to be about 30, 20 to 30 decibels. Normal conversation around 50 to 60, and then we'll see when you get up to 80 and 90, you're getting to loud sounds. Things above that are industrial sounds, and these are the things that are damaging over long periods of time. And some, some sounds are loud enough that one exposure is enough to cause permanent hearing damage. This is why young children have the greatest range of hearing, because they haven't yet been exposed to all of these sounds and things that can damage their hearing. All right, so here, zero decibels is the lowest audible sound. So 30, this is our quiet whisper. 40, this is, you know, a quiet room. Uh, 50, maybe a refrigerator, light traffic at a distance. Now, air conditioning, sewing machine, this is getting to be kind of loud. Busy traffic, noisy restaurant. If you have this continuously going on, like you live in New York City, yeah, you're going to have some damage. 80 feet more than, or sorry, 80 decibels for more than eight hours, this is going to cause permanent hearing damage. So you imagine, this is cumulative too, so you can imagine people in New York City getting on the subway every day. You know they're going to be exposed to it for more than eight hours. So now we're getting into shop tools, things over 90 decibels, gas lawnmowers. Less than eight hours exposure will cause uh, permanent hearing damage. And then chainsaws, these kind of things, two hours of this will cause permanent hearing damage. That's 100 decibels. Now we're getting to our heavy metal con concert, sandblasting. These are things that can cause immediate hearing damage. Gunshot, jet planes, you know, you're not going to recover from that. By the time you <laughs> get close to a rocket launch, you probably blow your eardrums out, actually. Um, hearing loss would be inevitable at 160 decibels. By this point, you would have uh, Anything above that's going to rupture your eardrums. In fact, you can have sound pressure waves so great that they'll actually cause a concussion of your brain, even without ever physically touching you or out at anything physically touching you. It'll cause the brain to vibrate within the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and it'll start to hit the, the skull. And you can have really, really loud concussive blast that can actually blow your lungs out. So, you know, sound, if it gets loud enough, can be quite a powerful force.